In a world where knowledge is power, the Academy of Emergency Sciences celebrates a decade of excellence. For 10 remarkable years, we have been a beacon of unmatched medical training, founded with a steadfast commitment to delivering unparalleled education the Academy of Emergency Sciences has consistently set the standard. Our distinguished faculty, comprised of specialist doctors, brings their extensive real-world experience to the forefront, ensuring that our students receive the highest caliber of education. From American Heart Association, AHA, Basic Life Support, BLS, to Advanced Cardiovascular Life Support, ACLS, and Pediatric Advanced Life Support PALS, courses. Our mission is to empower our students to lead resuscitations with absolute confidence. Consistently top-rated courses, a testament to our unwavering commitment to providing an exceptional learning experience, proven by our countless satisfied students. Yet, our commitment extends beyond the fundamentals. Academy of Emergency Sciences goes the extra mile, offering supplementary courses, including the complementary advanced airway course, enriching our students' knowledge. Join us in our mission to create a safer world through knowledge, expertise, and an unwavering dedication to life-saving. Academy of Emergency Sciences. Resuscitation is our calling, education our passion. In a world where knowledge is power, the Academy of Emergency Sciences celebrates a decade of excellence. For 10 remarkable years, we have been a beacon of unmatched medical training, founded with a steadfast commitment to delivering unparalleled education. The Academy of Emergency Sciences has consistently set the standard. Our distinguished faculty, comprised of specialist doctors, brings their extensive real-world experience to the forefront ensuring that our students receive the highest caliber of education. From American Heart Association, AHA, Basic Life Support, BLS, to Advanced Cardiovascular Life Support, ACLS, and Pediatric Advanced Life Support, PALS, courses. Our mission is to empower our students to lead resuscitations with absolute confidence. Consistently top-rated courses, a testament to our unwavering commitment to providing an exceptional learning experience, proven by our countless satisfied students. Yet, our commitment extends beyond the fundamentals. Academy of Emergency Sciences goes the extra mile, offering supplementary courses, including the complementary advanced airway course, enriching our students' knowledge, Join us in our mission to create a safer world through knowledge, expertise, and an unwavering dedication to life-saving.
Academy of Emergency Sciences. Resuscitation is our calling, education our passion. In a world where knowledge is power, the Academy of Emergency Sciences celebrates a decade of excellence. For 10 remarkable years, we have been a beacon of unmatched medical training, founded with a steadfast commitment to delivering unparalleled education. The Academy of Emergency Sciences has consistently set the standard. Our distinguished faculty, comprised of specialist doctors, brings their extensive real-world experience to the forefront, ensuring that our students receive the highest caliber of education. From American Heart Association, AHA, Basic Life Support, BLS, to Advanced Cardiovascular Life Support, ACLS, and Pediatric Advanced Life Support, PALS, courses. Our mission is to empower our students to lead resuscitations with absolute confidence. Consistently top-rated courses, a testament to our unwavering commitment to providing an exceptional learning experience, proven by our countless satisfied students. Yet, our commitment extends beyond the fundamentals. Academy of Emergency Sciences goes the extra mile offering supplementary courses, including the complimentary advanced airway course, enriching our students' knowledge. Join us in our mission to create a safer world through knowledge, expertise, and an unwavering dedication to life-saving. Academy of Emergency Sciences. Resuscitation is our calling, education our passion. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Before we begin, let's just set a few ground rules. For those joining us via Zoom, kindly keep your microphones on mute. Um, you can type in your questions at any time in the chat box. Uh, same uh, with the participants who are joining us via live streaming via YouTube. And the attendance link for your uh, attendance certificate will be sent during the question and answer portion. All right. So uh, just uh, keep posted uh, in the chat box for the attendance link later. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed good colleagues morning. and young doctors. Yeah. Greetings and welcome to our distinguished webinar series, REM, Resuscitation Essentials for Moonlighters, a tribute to the decade of excellence at the Academy of Emergency Sciences as an accredited American Heart Association training partner for BLS, ACLS, and PALS, we have consistently upheld the belief that resuscitation is not merely a task, it is an unwavering calling. Our motto, resuscitation is our calling, education, our passion, underscores our enduring commitment to the art of life-saving. The choice of the acronym REM for this webinar is not by chance. It reflects a profound connection with scientific research, suggesting that REM sleep, is when we most effectively consolidate learning and memory. Today, we gather to deepen your knowledge and enhance your resuscitation skills with the firm belief that the wisdom imparted here will translate into lives saved. 
This year long webinar series is a generously offered free of charge, our humble contribution to advancing the realm of resuscitation education. We are resolute in our mission to empower young doctors and healthcare professionals with the essential knowledge required for their arduous moonlighting shifts. We express our profound gratitude for your presence here today, and we invite you to embark on this journey of enlightenment with us. Together, let us strive for excellence. And remember, resuscitation is our calling, education our passion. It is with great anticipation that we look forward to collectively advancing our understanding and proficiency in resuscitation. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker for today. So our speaker for today uh, took his Bachelor in Science in Biology in Ateneo de Manila and further studied Doctor of Medicine and Master of Business Administration at the Ateneo de Manila School of Medicine and Public Health. He took up his residency in emergency medicine and served as the chief resident for the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Medical City Ortigas. Currently, he is an active consultant at the Emergency Department of the Medical City and an active instructor for BLS and ACLS at the Academy of Emergency Sciences. May I add that our speaker today is also a cycling and mobility advocate and has been featured in several media outlets like the Philippine Star, uh, JMA News, ABS CBN, CNN. All right. So if he looks familiar, uh, during the height of the COVID pandemic, uh, Dr. Amali was featured as one of the hardworking doctors who would deliver uh, COVID care kits from the office of the vice president. So he would take his trusty bike around Metro Manila and deliver COVID care packages, no? even when he is from duty and sometimes off duty. No? So uh, it is with great privilege and honor that I introduce our speaker today, Dr. Alejandro uh, Gabriel O'Malley. Uh, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, so well, uh, thank you everyone for attending this webinar. Um, I am very grateful for uh, being invited to talk to you today about the topic that uh, uh, actually uh, very much close to my heart. So as uh, Doc Pao mentioned, uh, resuscitation is definitely one of the things that we are very passionate about. So let me just share my screen. Okay. So so the, to the topic for today that uh, I would like to talk to you guys about is uh, the, the title of the talk is We've Got a Pulse Now, Post-Cardiac Arrest Care in the Emergency Department. So uh, the premise of this talk is um, what do we do when we finally achieve ROSC in a patient that we've um, done BLS and ACLS? So what are our next steps? So I have no conflict of interest. And then my resources are mostly based on the AHA guidelines to post cardiac arrest care. But um, and then so the lecture will be focused on that, and then special considerations and what else. So my references include the AHA ACLS guidelines of twenty twenty with some amendments. So may there are um, the AHA uh, release, um, some updates uh, every year. And then we also use the I also uh, use the European Resuscitation Guidelines from uh twenty twenty three and then some uh, articles from Rebel EM, uh Tentinalis Emergency Medicine and other journals and studies. So I would like to share my acknowledgments to the following doctors. Okay, now so once we have achieved ROSC, um so when you remember your ACLS guidelines, uh when you have achieved ROSC, so you go out of your uh, cardiac arrest algorithm. So, but then you have to be careful because you have to determine which of the following have you achieved. If the heart rate of the patient who has achieved ROSC is less than 50 beats per minute, then you go to your bradycardia algorithm. If it's one, uh, greater than or equal to 150 beats per minute, then you go to your tachycardia algorithm because more or less you need to further resuscitate and stabilize your patient. But if you achieve ROSC and then the heart rate of your patient is uh, more than greater than 50 and or, le or uh, uh, sorry, that's greater than 50 and less than 150 beats per minute, then you, you proceed with your post-cardiac arrest care. So this is the post-cardiac arrest care algorithm or, uh, based on the 2020 ECLS guidelines by the AHA. So we'll break it down into 
two major um uh phases no in the initially initial stabilization phase and the continued management in additional emergent activities phase okay so the initial stabilization phase consists of your uh, airway breathing and circulation so it's broken down into those parameters so we'll go we'll get into that in a minute then your continued management and additional emergent activities are broken down into different yeah um interventions so cardiac interventions your protection other critical care uh, management evaluation and treating uh um um reversal etiologies and expert consultation and continued management so for the initial stabilization phase, so it as I mentioned earlier, it consists with your airway, breathing, and circulation. Okay. Now, so first and foremost, if you have achieved ROSC, you have to be able to have managed the airway. Now, for for uh during during your ECLS, no, um, if if um you've been with um AES and you've took up our our ECLS course, we always consider during the two minutes of um, high quality CPR, you, you check three things, and one of them is the airway. If you haven't intubated the patient at this point in time, you have to um, intubate the patient so, to secure that airway. So let's say, for example, you have achieved, um, for some reason, you weren't able to, to intubate your patient or secure an advanced airway during uh, your uh, resuscitation phase. And then once you've stabilized, uh, you achieved draws, uh, you have to make sure that the airway is in place. So early placement of an advanced airway and endotracheal intubation is still the preferred, the gold standard. So of course, um, we still have um, direct laryngoscopy, but video laryngoscopy, if available, is preferred. So it increases first pass success and um, increases the safety of the provider. Use waveform capnography to determine ET tube placement. So later on, I'll discuss that. But aside from your checking of your um, uh, breaths, yeah, you can use your uh, waveform capnograph to determine if the ET tube is in the right place. So initial ventilation, um, so 10 breaths per minute by a bag valve mask ventilation. So um, one breath every six seconds is still the preferred one uh, before mechanical ventilation. And your target SpO2 is 92 to 98%. It is recommended that you um, uh, provide um, oxygenation at an FiO2 100%. Other modalities to confirm ET tube placement could be your chest X-ray and point of care ultrasound if available. Now, so this is your waveform capnograph. So, um, this is uh, when when. So this is a waveform capnograph. So this is a sample monitor, and this is what it should look like. So as a review, once you intubate the patient, you have to look for what we call a rise the toe fall waveform pattern. So this assures you that the endotracheal tube is in the trachea and not in the, uh, it's not a gastric intubation. Uh, if you see, if you do not see a rise plateau fall pattern, then you, you have to reconsider intubating, re-intubating your patient. Okay. Now, so once you've secured the airway, then you proceed with mechanical ventilation. You know? So uh, mechanical ventilation and target parameters and other considerations. Also. So, so when we're talking about, so this is an overview course. So mechanical ventilation is very, uh, it's a, it's a topic on its on its own. So in itself, it's a, um, it takes a while to lecture, uh, mechanical ventilation. But what's more important is what are your initial settings for your mechanical ventilation? No, so as an overview, your ventilator settings include mode, tidal volume, peak, FiO two, and respiratory. So ventilator settings, you have to consider your um type of uh ventilator. No? So your mode con mode control versus assist control. No? So control means the ventilator, uh it's it, the ventilator determines the breaths of the patient. You preset your rate and tidal volume and it blocks spontaneous breaths. Assist control allows the patient to initiate the breath and then the vent will deliver a preset tidal volume. The machine will set a minimum rate so the apnea will not occur if the patient does not initiate the breath. So what, what it means the uh when you control is fully the vent is fully uh, uh breathing for the patient. Assist control is when your patient has spontaneous breathing and then it allows your patient to initiate those breaths. Um so uh sorry, this is uh, uh sorry, uh, I, I will correct this though. It usually is control. 
uh, purely control for uh, for patients who are not spontaneous breathing. But if your patient achieves ROSC ROSC and has spontaneous breath, then you can do assist control for most of your patients. So what about the volume versus pressure? So volume volume uh, setting uh, basically means you you are the one who set the tidal volumes. The provider sets the tidal volume. Airy pressures depend on the tidal volume plus the size and compliance of the respiratory system. So the tidal volume that we use for patients, uh, it is now advocated that we use what we call long protective volumes. So you, the tidal volume that you set uh, in the ventilator is um, 6 to 8 ml per kilogram per ideal body weight. So let's say, for example, you set your mechanical ventilator to... Uh, uh, Volume AC, so volume assist control. Then you set your tidal volume. Let's say your patient's height is around um five six. And then you compute your ideal body weight, which is like um six 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 sixty five. So let's say, or let's say for example, your ideal body weight of your patient is seven. So if, if you're going to assign long protective volumes, your um tidal volume should be uh from so four hundred twenty m uh. So, yeah, 422, um, so around 6 to 8 ml per kilogram per body weight. So, 420. Okay. So, pressure control or pressure mode is the ventilator will raise the airway pressure, a prescribed amount over the uh, peak for a set amount of time or I time. So, you set peak in I time. Uh, tidal volume depends on the resistance and compliance of the respiratory system. So, start with a pressure control of 10 cm uh, water above peak and adjust the pressure down or up to target a tidal volume of 6 to 8 ml per kilogram per year. Now, if you would ask me what would be the, the in good initial setting, um, a lot of people start off with volume control, volume assist control first because it's easier to set the tidal volume um, based on your patient's ideal body weight. Um, and then let the ventilator um, um, dictate the pressures. Uh, it's Sorry, it's hard to it's hard to target um, your plateau pressures because I think it's a bit more complicated. And at the same time, post ROSC patients, a lot of them uh, uh, are are in spontaneous breathing as well. So this is just a summary from Rebel EM. So volume assist control. Oh, uh, so types of breast uh, control. Assisted or controlled. So uh, we set the backup rate as well so that when the patient does not spontaneously breathe, the, the mechanical ventilator beats for the patient. So that's a preset tidal volume, dependent variable are your plateau pressures. So control tidal volume and then control minute ventilation. So you set your tidal volume and your respiratory rate versus your assist control that I mentioned. Okay. So if you would ask me what is the easier one to set, it would be your volume assist. So this is just for post ROSC care. Okay. Then we target our PEEP. So PEEP basically is positive, positive end expiratory pressure. So it improves oxygenation by increasing the mean airway pressure with PEEP. So PEEP improves oxygenation by recruiting additional lung units. So alveoli, you know, this, it prevents collapse of your alveoli and increasing the surface area for gas exchange and redistributing lung volume. So initial settings for PEEP, um, so during post cardiac arrest is 5 cmh2 for most patients. So FIL2, no? So, um, so once you've set your mode, so volume assist, so set your tidal volume, um, so 6 to 8 ml per kilogram. Now you set your PEEP to 5 initial settings and then you set your FIO2. So FIO2 is basically, how do you set it? Um, we usually start with a hundred percent FIO2, but then so that you achieve a uh, target SpO2 of ninety two to ninety eight percent. Hyperoxia and hypoxia should both be uh, avoided. Now, so this is just uh, as an aside, no. Um, FIO2 and PEEP are both used to increase oxygenation, no. Um, uh, in you increase oxygenation by increasing the amount of uh, fraction of inspired oxygen or you you do wrong long recruitment maneuvers via peep. So as a good setting first, target uh, people five 
if I go to 100%, then you adjust accordingly. Some patients might not respond kasi with a peak of 5, especially when your patients suffer from cardiac arrest due to uh, respiratory, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So, when you adjust your peak, you increase your peep slowly, incremental changes of 2 cm each to every 10 to 20 minutes. Um, then you observe your patient. Rapidly increasing peep or decreasing peep has been uh, linked to potential anticipated hemodynamic intertrosic or interpulmonary changes. So your patient might have, for example, hypotension if you increase peep too fast. So this is a basic table um, from ArtsNet. So this has been popularized during COVID pandemic when a lot of patients uh, are suffering from ARDS for uh, from COVID. So this basically means that there is a certain um, amount of uh, PEEP to FIO2 ratio. No? So the first part is low FIO2, high PEEP. Uh, sorry, uh, low FIO2, high, uh, low PEEP. So you increase your FIO2 in accordance to the PEEP settings. So you, you titrate um, FIO2 and PEEP at the same time. Then you observe your patient. So, but of course, we always um, uh, start off with five uh, uh, CMH2. So, FIO2 here, uh, 0.3 is also based on the EPG. But re always remember your goal. So, your goal always is to have a saturation of, well, for ARGSnet, it's 80 to 95. But post-arrest patients is 95 to 100%. Okay. Now, um. Once you've set your vent, your mode, tidal volume, PEEP, um, FIO2, then you set your backup rate or respiratory rate. So um, the respiratory rate is usually set at 10 to 12 at the start, then you titrate accordingly. How do you titrate? You use your N-tidal CO2 monitoring to target an end of 35 to 45. And then eventually when you get an EVG, you target the uh, PACO2, 35 to 45 millimeters per day. Um, so, so you need target like, for setting uh, backup rate or respiratory rate. So here in the diagram, so you start at 10 breaths per minute, you target an SpO2 of 90 to 98% and a PaCO2 of 35 to 40. So basically, in this diagram from ERC, so you target your saturation so to so sa ano kasi, sa ER, so in ACLS, it's 92 to 98. In AJ, in ERC, it's 94 to 90. So just target like around like 95 to 98%. So safety margin, kaya naman talaga safety margin. With a PACO2 of 4.5 to 6 kilopascals or 35 to 45 millimeters mercury. And a tidal volume 6 to 8 ml per kilogram. So in your initial settings. So volume AC, tidal volume 6 to 8, peep of 5, start at 5, peep, sorry. And then um target SPO2 of, uh, of 98. 92 to 98 percent, 35 to 45 at go or PACO2, and then uh, yeah, so you can start from there. Now, so other considerations. So once you've intubated your patient, you set the ventilator. You can you you, you can do you use your adjuncts like imaging and EEG. So your chest X-ray and chest ultrasound are useful for visualization of lung pathology and also placement of your endotracheal tube. Um, chest ultrasound is useful for um, pleural diffusion, guidance of procedures. Chest X-ray also helps you detect if there are um, pneumothoraces or uh, or pleural diffusion that you uh, that you need to appreciate, especially in in sometimes no, um, it's not easy to appreciate uh, uh, breath sounds during the uh, cardiac arrest phase. You might think that decreased cha due to to, despite adjusting the ET tube. So the chest X-ray will help you do that. EBGs are also used to, to guard your target parameters. No? So um, your initial target parameters will be based on your ETCO and SPO2. But then, of course, once you get your EBGs, you you adjust your um, uh, parameters accordingly. You use your target FIO2 based on the PAO2 of the patient, target PACO2. I just noted here PACO2 versus PA versus ETCO. No? So there's a variable, there's a minimal difference between ETCO and PACO2. So um, PACO2 may be lower at times than 
than uh, sorry, at co may be lower at times than your actual PACO2 and EPG. So make sure you still get an EPG. Uh, and uh, look at your patient's uh, PACO2 and adjust the ventilator accordingly. So moving forward to circulation. So um in circulation, we we manage your target parameters, you determine the type of shock, then you consider agents of maintaining hemodynamic stability and other considerations and obtaining a 12 ECG. Now, so for target parameters, no, so it, it is recommended that you um make sure that your patient's uh, blood pressure uh, has a map of higher than 65 millimeters per kg. So this this it ensures adequate circulation for um your uh brain so your uh brain perfusion and even renal perfusion. Um, in the EHA guidelines, they recommend um both a BP of more than ninety, uh SBP of higher than ninety or a map greater than sixty five. Then ERC adds urine output of 0.5 ml per kilogram per hour. So that ensures that your patient is uh, well perfused. So that's your target uh, blood pressure. Now, next is the type of shock. So there are basically four types of shock. Uh, you might remember this in um, during your clinical encounters or literature review or even your meds. Days. So hypovolemic shock is basically volume loss. You know? So it could be um, either uh, from uh, water loss, vomiting, diarrhea, instead of vomiting, diarrhea, or even heat stroke. Or it could be from hemorrhage or bleeding. It's hemorrhage and bleeding, no? It's it's more important. It's also important, aside from your ACLS um, um maneuvers, to uh, do bleeding control, no? So and then consider uh, you have to consider transfusion of, of blood products or a massive transfusion protocol. Um, usually when when a patient is suffering from hemorrhagic shock, um, crystalloids uh, uh, or fluid uh, IV fluids are not enough. Um, as an aside, no, your uh, ATLS guidelines actually only recommend one liter of LR before, uh, before transitioning to blood. No? So why is that? Because when you when you replace blood with water, quote unquote water, uh, you don't replace you only replace volume. You don't replace um your blood parameters, your platelets, your coagulation factors. So if you lose blood, you replace it with blood. Next type of shock is distributive shock, no? So basically loss of vasomotor tone. Um most common is septic shock. No? Anaphylactic shock is also a type of distributive shock. So for septic shock, uh, which is uh um encountered a lot of uh, uh patients come in for severe fever, uh, sepsis, and then uh, succumb to septic shock. So fluid resuscitation, source control, and uh, you can review your surviving sepsis guidelines. Cardiogenic shock no, is basically pump failure. So when your heart um is too weak to to, to create circulation. No? So in patients who suffer from cardiac arrest, the most common cause of cardiac arrest is still um coronary artery disease no? and uh, MI. Um the most important thing is to detect if your patient is suffering from STEMI because um uh later on we'll we'll discuss why uh, detection of STEMI is important. Of course, if it's a, if the patient may not be suffering from STEMI, then you could still consider coronary cause and other cardiac pathology. And then lastly, it's your obstructive shock. So obstructive shock prevents the uh, the heart from functioning or pumping properly or getting filled up properly. So there are two types, two contribution, two pathologies that contribute to your obstructive shock, which is your cardiac tamponade and then your tension in the thorax. Okay, so um, this is a good uh, um diagram from easy med learning. So uh we've always taught um the four types of shock as tank, um the, the tank which is the heart, you no, know, so and then the vasculature which is the pumps, and then the the volume or the gas which is the blood. So if the pump doesn't work, meaning to say the heart isn't pumping well due to intrinsic factors in this cardiogenic shock. There is no gas, meaning to say there is no flu fluid circulation, then it's hypovolemic shock. Gas blockage, meaning to say there's there is a obstruction or blockage that does not allow the, the system to pump properly, then it's obstructive shock. And then if the hose, your pipes are leaky, then most probably it's distributive shock. Okay. So 
Um, for agents of oh, maintaining hemodynamic stability, so for fluids, no crystalloids are preferred agents. Um, lactated ringers versus um uh, normal uh, saline solution. So um critical care um studies have shown that um lactated ringers uh although mixing studies no lactated ringers is uh, pro uh is preferred because um saline uh, recitation using uh NaCl leads to uh hyperchloremic metabolic acid system. So um if you if there if your patients uh come in it's preferred to to uh start with lactated ringers if it's available. Just have yeah just have to be careful with normal saline solution no? because it can contribute to hyperchloremic metabolic acid disease. Um blood no so early transfusion for patients who are suffering from blood loss and if your institution has a massive transfusion protocol, then it will be better if you activate that. No, not all institutions have massive transfusion protocols, but it will be uh, prudent for you to ask if your institution has wherever your practice. Now, with vasopressors and inotropes, no, so we have your um, uh, choices of norepinephrine, epinephrine, dobutamine. Now, so of course, uh, you can read up on all these vasopressors, but as a note, lang. Usually, norepinephrine is the first line vasodrepper with epinephrine as a repressive alternative, except in anaphylactic shock, wherein epinephrine is first line. So, norepinephrine kasi, um, allows for vasoconstrictor and it has some alpha effect, beta and alpha effects of it as well, bear more of alpha, so vasoconstrictor. So, it's usually the first line, no, uh, vasopressor. But you have to continue to find reversible causes of shock and adding and switching to your inotrope vasopressor support to. To more appropriate for the condition. So if your patient is suffering from um sepsis, septic shock, so more epinephrine. Or let's say, for example, your patient is suffering from cardiogenic shock, and then you might add dopamine on top of your norepinephrine. Okay, so norepinephrine is usually is usually the safer first line choice. Then you continue to assess your patient. But in, in anaphylactic shock, which is a distributive type of shock, then epinephrine is first line. First epinephrine. As a different. Okay, so uh, in this diagram again from ERC, so it is shown here. Sorry, use crystalloids to correct hypovolemia. Um, target map of more than sixty five. So urinary output of more than 0.5 ml per kilo per hour. Okay, then other considerations in obtaining a twelve DTCG. So it is important now once you've um, started your airway breathing circulation parameters, then you consider getting a 12 ECG. Because as I mentioned earlier, the uh, uh, most common cause of cardiac arrest is still coronary or NMI. To stem your recognition, rapid and early detection of other conditions such as your hyperhypokalemia or hypomagnesemia or tosatipoa. So hyperkalemia, peak key waves, hypokalemia, rapid key waves, hypomagnesemia is a uh, prolonged QT interval. So, or if you see the source of the pot. And other arrhythmias as well. So your 12 DTCG could help you determine um, if your patient needs rapid uh, STEMI recognition and activation of STEMI protocols and other cardiac pathologies. So now we go on to the continued management and additional emergent activities. So, so continued management and additional emergent activities focus on cardiac interventions, neuroprotection, neurologic interventions, and other critical care management. And then expert consultation and completed management. Now, for cardiac interventions, so STEMI and early STEMI and early revascularization. So, um, it is grade one evidence to perform coronary angiography right away for OCA patients with suspected cardiac etiology and arrest and ST segment elevation of ECG. So it is important that you perform uh, angi angiography with PCI right away. No, say this may prove that this increases survival. No? When you highly suspect AMI, activate local protocols for treatment and coronary perfusion. In the absence of evidence identifying the optimal timing for coronary PCI in post cardiac arrest patients suspecting of having ACS, but they don't have STEMI and ECG, an interventional cardiologist should still be con consulted because uh, for them to be able to determine the time of angiography and PCI based on local protocols. No, so sometimes kasi when you when history dictates so chest pain, they have freezes, and then arrested, and then you're able to rosk the patient. Pero the patient does not show any stem signs of STEMI in ECG. 
the patient might still be suffering from coronary origin of his car his or her cardiac arrest. Still warranted to refer the patient to cardiologist. Some studies have shown success in primary lysis, um, if you see STEMI and um, a PCI or it's not available in your locality, no. So, but then it is still the recommendation is still to go for angiogram and PCI. But hindi siya available in your locality. Still, um, activate your local protocols and coronary perfusion protocols that might uh, have um if in the PCI uh, fibrinolysis, but you know at least have a coronary interventional cardiologist on board. Then concurrent PCI and targeted temperature management protocols are uh, safe. So unstable cardiogenic shock, no. So um. More, more or less kasi na you still have to determine if your patient is suffering from a primary cardiac cause of his arrest or her arrest. So, inotrope support, mechanical support, and clinical team expert in the consultation. So, yun lang. Inotrope support is, like I mentioned earlier, start with your norepinephrine and then if you see that your patient is primarily suffering from a tank prob uh, sorry, a pump problem, so you might have to add dobutamine or other devices. But mechanical support, um, if it's available in your institution, and also consult critical care and cardiology. So mechanical circulatory support, so ito lang yung uh, other options that you may or may not have. So ventricular assist devices or LVADs, stuff like that, IABP, and then VAF. So these are advanced mechanisms. So um, And these are usually done in the ED or in the ICU with um, working together with your uh, either crit care or cardio uh, services. Now, Let's say um after you've determined your card your your other parameters, now the, the next step is to determine if your patient follows commands or not. Okay, so basically if your patient is awake or not. If your patient follows commands, we can see more or less after the cardiac arrest, you have achieved ROS and your patient is awake and able to follow commands, then you um proceed with other critical care management. Continuously monitor core temperature, prevent hyper or hypothermia, maintain normoxia, normocapnia, and euglycemia. So your target parameters for these patients are an SpO2 of 92-98%, BCO2 of 35-45, and a blood glucose of 150-180 mg. So we don't want their blood glucose too high, of course, we, don't, we all know that, but we don't also want them too low. Because critically ill patients uh, need more um, nutritional support, so blood glucose shouldn't be too low as well. Now, what if uh after that no you still uh uh provide lung protective ventilation and if EEG is available in your center and uh you can also do this for your patient to detect non-convulsive seizures. But what if your patient is not awake or does not follow commands? Then you proceed to the following targeted temperature management temperature management, CT scan or brain CT, EEG monitoring, and other critical care management. So targeted temperature management is basically cooling down the body you know, to a certain temperature because it, it is the only intervention proven to improve neurologic recovery after cardiac arrest. It is initiated as soon as possible by high-performance teams. So basically, pag nag-ross yung patient, hindi siya follow ng commands, then you consider cooling down the body to create your protection. Target parameters include the body temperature of 32 to 34 degrees Celsius for the first 24 hours. The body temperature is ideally measured by esophageal bladder and PA catheters. But, you know, um, even in my center, sometimes you don't have these available. So we still use the um, uh, in-ear th uh, thermometer. So at least in your uh, for body temperature measuring. So it just shows that um, the TTM, pro TTM process, so this is from Tetanalis, emergency medicine. So it is important to cool the body uh, as soon as ROS is achieved and that the patient is determined to be not responsive or not awake. So cooling, uh, and then there's a maintenance phase of 24 hours, and then rewarming is usually done for uh, done in the IC. So um, these are inclusion criteria, suggested inclusion and exclusion criteria for post-arrest targeted temperature management. So inclusion criteria includes post-resuscitation loss or a GCS motor score of 6 or if the patient is not awake. No, no other reason for coma, meaning to say if you've done a CT scan and there's no other reason for coma, no DNR, DNI status, and some institutions, um, parang, uh, they recommend 
an adult age no kasi mixed use studies for a targeted temperature management in children exclusion criteria of course if the patient is alert to make regard the arrest arrest of traumatic etiology because it has been shown that cooling the body down might lead to further bleeding no? so arrest associated with significant bleeding Coma or vegetative state prior to arrest because um, targeted temperature management will not bring the patient to a higher baseline. Pregnancy, there are mixed studies, no? And the DNR, DNI status because that's already for palliation. Not an exclusion criteria, patient on warfarin or heparin, initial arrest. Arrest rhythm was non shockable and long invasive. For this one, kasi, there are studies that have been shown to improve neurologic outcomes in PEA arrest. Uh, who were play, who achieved ROSC and were placed in uh, targeted temperature management. So, some some of you might ask, how do we achieve poor body temperature? No, oh, especially in a setting uh, we don't have those advanced machines. Uh, even in the states, no, um, I've been in conventions where they do ice packs, so you don't need the 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 fancy technology to start the targeted temperature management. So lower core body temperature to 32 to 36 degrees Celsius as soon as possible, but within four to six hours, return of spontaneous circulation. Some centers argue 32 to 34. Surface cooling. So here, as mentioned, chilled saline or ice packs in the axillary, neck, and groin. So where you uh, uh, have a greater density of your blood vessels. Cooling blankets, vests, and leg wraps, and a cooling helmet. So these are not readily available in a lot of centers in the Philippines. But here, here is where we can intervene. So we can also do intravascular cooling. Make sure that the patient is intubated, uh, has already been intubated, and mechanical ventilation is already in place. An EEG, if ECG and continuous cardiac monitoring, because of symmetry, so cardiac monitors, capnograph, EV monitoring. Um. If you are if you start cooling no, and, and it is appropriate that you refer your patient to uh, critical care service or if you uh, or uh, to start sedation in your muscular muscular blocking because once you start cooling shivering will be your ano, problem no? so the patient tends to shiver so if your patient shivers no um, you won't be able to hit your target temperature so uh, you can refer your patients to uh, critical care or or um, specialty services for sedation in neurovascular okay. okay. So, of course, these are the other parameters that you need to do as well. What can you do also? Maintain your map more than 60, check electrolytes every 4 hours, maintain hypothermia from 12 to 24 hours. Do not let your core temperature drop less than 30 degrees. So, I think the thing that I want you guys to know is um, TTM can be started in the ER. Okay. So the next step is obtaining a brain CT, no? So brain imaging predicting poor neurological outcome after cardiac arrest in combination with other predictors. So uh, important in brain CT kasi is you need to check for a central neurologic or structural cause of cardiac arrest, which is your uh, intrahem intracranial hemorrhage, either subarachnoid, epidural, or uh, in, uh, ICH, no? So, the presence of generalized brain edema manifested by marked reduction of the gray matter, white matter ratio of brain CT can be used to predict poor neurological outcome in combination with other methods of prognostication. However, it is not recommended to do neurological prognostication less than 24 hours post -dose. Okay. So, EEG monitoring, if it's available in your center, it is used to detect and treat non-convulsive seizures post arrest Also used to diagnose LE electrographic seizure in patients with clinical convulsions and to monitor treatment effects. But however, no, um, if the patient is not showing any signs of seizure or um, EEG-wise, wala siyang seizure na non-convulsive, you don't need to give anti-seizure uh, anti meds. So routine seizure prophylaxis is not, it's not recommended. Then other critical care management, no? so sa ICU na to. So central access, more advanced monitoring. But I, uh, as I mentioned here, neuroprognostication, no, it's very difficult thing to do. So you really need experts on board neurology, neurosurgery, clinical care. and But then guidelines are recommended to not do it earlier than 24 hours. So even some after, not delayed after 72 hours. Definitely not within the first 20 hours. Then it's also multimodal. So I skip that slide. Now, finally, 
uh, evaluate and treat rapidly reversible etiologies no? and involve expert consultation for completed branch. So, you evaluate and treat rapidly reversible etiologies, you just have to go back to your HSMPs. So, um, during your HCLS algorithm, you're always asked to, to think about your HSMPs so that you can achieve ROSC. But once you've achieved ROSC, no, you still have to continually check your HSMPs and reverse them accordingly. So hypovolemia, basically shock, no? fluids, blood, and your uh, pharmacologic interventions. Hypoxia, so always remember your target parameters. H plus or iodine acidosis. You can do this by history and previous laboratories, EBG and blood gas analysis, and emergent dialysis for intractable acidosis. Um, it is controversial. It is not recommended to routinely give sodium bicarbonate in patients who who na blanket rule. It's not it's no longer recommended to do that. But if your patient um uh, uh, is, uh, if sodium bicarbonate is recommended or warranted for your patient, you just have to be careful because you might need to adjust your uh, ventilator settings. Remember that sodium bicarbonate breaks down to CO2 and water once in the bloodstream. So you might be addressing the metabolic acidosis, but your patient may might suffer from um uh respiratory acidosis naman if your patient is not ventilated. So hypo, hyperkalemia, so hyperkalemia, potassium correction, hyperkalemia, calcium gluconate, calcium carbonate, glucose, and insulin diffusion. Hypothermia, so adequate warming, warm blood products and IV fluids, no? especially if you practice in a center where bedding, uh, drowning, or high altitude, na bilang nilabing, wala mag snow or winter sa Philippines. Just have to be warranted. Be mindful of that. Tension pneumothorax is um, ideally diagnosed prior to the chest x-ray. So if you if you see tracheal deviation or decreased breath sounds despite your ano, your uh, uh, adjustment of the ED tube, then you can do your needle decompression and proceed to chest tube placement. But uh, if, let's say, for example, you see it in the chest x-ray, then you still need to detect your and do your interventions accordingly. No, you cannot leave uh, needle. You cannot just do needle decompression and not proceed to chest tube placement. Because uh, uh, the, the needle decompression is just a temporary intervention. You need to proceed to chest tube placement for definitive match. Cardiac tamponade, no? So point of care ultrasound and pericardiocentesis to treat obstructive shock. So you need to work with uh, people who are capable and are experts in doing bedside pericardial synthesis. Toxins, no? So in toxins, you need good history, information gathering. Uh, you need to contact your national poison control. So UPPJH and East Avenue are our national poison control centers. Not, toxin, not all toxins have antidotes, okay? So supportive management is still imperative. But even during our... Uh, toxicology patients, no, uh, ABCD is pa rin ang pinaka-important. So, primary is But then, of course, uh, for certain toxins like paracetamol and acetylcysteine, organophosphates, atropine, benzodiazepines, flamazinil, opioids, naloxone, and rifampicin, peridoxin. So, consider those as well. But um, if you do not have an in-house toxicologist uh, in your institution, uh, you can call the National Poison Control Center. So, for toxicologic guidance. Thrombosis, pulmonary, AK, pulmonary embolism. Um, expert consultation is warranted to a uh, vascular surgeon or vascular cardiologist. Some studies have shown success in fibrinolysis during uh, uh, like giving a uh, retiplase or altiplase for pulmonary embolism, but uh, hindi pa hard and fast yung recommendation. So expert consultation para hindi pa sa veteran. Uh, Thrombosis cardiac, of course, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, so so this is a good slide, a summary slide from uh from the emergency Ma medicine department of uh University of Ottawa. So number one, uh immediate twelve lead ECG point of care ultrasound to narrow down your differential if it's available. So ECG is important. Number two, remember target parameters SpO two of ninety. 4 to 98, so it's diba, dependent on for 92 to 98 in the aging guidelines. PO2 of less than 200 millimeters uh, mercury. Number three, end tidal CO2 of 35 to 45 or 30 to 40 in this diagram. Arterial PCO2 of 35 to 40. So, as I mentioned, 
may difference kasi yung head ko at saka yung PU. So, kung head ko yung gagamitin mo, some people add get 30 to 40 para may safety margin ka. But if you have an EPG, still better do an EPG with target PCO2. 35 to 45. Maintain your mean arterial pressure of 165 millimeters mercury. Consider patient-specific MAC targets. No? Uh, so, for with expert consultation. Titrate to end organ perfusion. So, I mentioned earlier, uh, ERC guidelines recommend uh, urine output of 0.5 ml per kilogram per Targeted temperature management. So, dito nakalagay 30 to 36. So, dun sa previous le uh, literature, 32 to 36. Prevent hyperthermia. Ang goal lang kasi dito is not higher than 36, not lower than 32. Revascularization, no? Um, ST elevation, suspected cardiac etiology. Consider still with no clear alternative cause. No? Kasi most common pa rin ang cardiac etiology for cardiac. Okay, so now that uh, we've done your uh, what to do when you achieve loss, what else is there? So your newer technologies like ECMO, uh, CPR, eCPR, mechanical CPR, invasive lights, invasive monitoring, cooling devices. Um, uh, I was contemplating or oh, talking about these things. However, uh, during last November uh, 29, I went into a Japan for a convention on the uh, um uh, with uh, EMS Asia, and then I attended what we call the Resuscitation Academy partnership with the Global Resuscitation Alliance. So what I realized is we focus on what is out there versus on what we can do body care. So this is the just like to share with you briefly what I attended. No, so this is the convention. We talked about a lot of things. No, we talked about the. Uh, the ILCOR and EEG guidelines. We talked about the tele-EMS, tele-ICU. We talked about other resuscitation parameters. So this is Dr. Tanaka. He's the convention. Here. But what uh, what really hit me is um, focusing on what is important. So here we see the chain of survival. So this is very familiar with us. Whatever type of diagram that you look, very similar. Now what was taught for, with during that conference is what we call the framework of Resuscitation. So leadership training, quality improvement, culture of excellence. So how what 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 is the how is this related to what I, I want to share with you? So in Taiwan, I showed this, I shared this with Dr. Palad. Um they did some protocol tweaks and then their CCF of their EMS team raised from 60% to 89.17%. So they uh, if you've if you've reviewed your ACLS guidelines, the target CCF is 60. Right? Because that doubles the survival. If it's 80, it triples it. So in Taiwan, they were able to increase their CCF for their pre-hospital care providers uh, by protocol tweaks to 89%. So what does that mean? Um, well, furthermore, I saw this article uh, based because I saw a picture of the chain of survival. This is an article by Charles Deacon where he focuses on the chain of survival, not li not all links are equal. So this article was shown during the convention, this, this picture, that you might see this as compared to this one, all the, the links of survival are equal in size, though, but we realize that not all links of survival are equal. So the most important thing still is still early recognition and call for help. But now, for our for for us providers, no, the most important is early CPR, high quality CPR, and early defibrillation. So as you, you mentioned, no, post resuscitation care is important, but it's not as important at least. So how does that trans translate to practice? So optimize PLS management. So before we even transition to our advanced cardiac life support interventions and our post trust care, make sure that your PLS management is optimal. So high quality CPR. Um, for individual, then you go to high performance CPR, meaning my meaning to say, um, minimal interruptions, good monitoring for CPR and early defibrillation. These are important things. So these are these increases survival for our patients. Then always be cognizant of truth smooth transition to ACLS. High quality CPR is still king. Uh, doesn't matter whatever medications that you give, whatever intervention that you do. If your CPR is crap, your patient will not survive but not achieve loss. Role assignment and knowing your equipment is important. It's what you have. Now, meaning say, know your defibrillators, know your medications, know your protocols, know your, your the people you need to call when you need help. 
recharger defibrillator no so if you've um if you have trained with us uh in AES when we advocate uh, during our ACLS no from 2020 onwards we advocate for recharging the defibrillator in anticipation of defibrillation because this minimizes um uh, interruptions for your hypothesis. Optimize ventilation, avoid hyperventilation. So it has been shown that hyperventilation actually decreases survival because um, of the unnecessary uh um ano, uh unnecessary uh, uh hemodynamic changes and increase intrathoracic pressure. For community and hospital management, no? so uh of course, in uh, uh, if you practice in the local community, always engage your uh, first responders and inter-hospital population. So focus on what you have and not what is out there so that you can actually optimize, optimize your results and uh, save more lives. So this is, I think I heard this uh, during a talk. I think, I don't know, I guess well, a few years ago, the smallest improvements to BLS is more worth more than the larger advantages in PCS. Okay, and then this is one of the slides that really hit home. You know, the the Global Resuscitation Alliance, so they mindset that everyone in particular fibrillation survives. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Umali, for a very comprehensive no, and uh, very thorough lecture on post cardiac arrest care. Right. So uh, if you if anyone would like to ask questions, so you can speak into your computer's microphone or I can read the questions um, via YouTube and uh, via the chat on Zoom. No? So, Dr. Umali, one of the common issues after uh, ROSC from cardiac arrest is the patient is usually hypotensive. So what is your general approach to addressing hypotension in in patients? So what vasopressor would be best? Should we start the patient on dopamine, uh, dobutamine, norepinephrine? Do we push fluids first? Or do we start Trendelenburg first and see how the patient responds? So what is, what is your general approach to hypotension post-arrest? Um, thank you for that question, Dom. Um, so, yung, ano, uh, as I mentioned earlier during my lecture, um, it is the, so you, you number one, um, Trendelenburg, I don't like it. I hate Trendelenburg. Multiple papers have been shown that Trendelenburg position is um, actually detrimental for your patients. No? Then Trendelenburg kasi, so it is actually the concept of ano, uh, passive leg raise. So, your patients, when you, you do Trendelenburg, the temporary lang effect niyan. It, 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 it increases your, uh, uh, no, your blood flow mo back to your, your heart, no? So, it increases your, um, blood flow, but then your body adjusts to it. So, the, temp, the effect is temporary. So, it actually increases, and it increases a lot of other things that create, uh, poor outcomes to your patient. So, don't do Trendelenburg. But I'm papers then. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, first line, and I consulted uh, critical care, actually Dr. Palo, I asked him about this also, norepinephrine pa rin, still the best first choice. No? So, increase vaso vaso motor tone. And then, norepinephrine kasi has beta effect as well. So, it has some beta effect. So, it's a good first line. No? Uh, increases your vaso motor tone. Uh, it, it helps, it, it has some beta effect. So, while you're determining the type of arrest that you have, or the type of hypotension or the type of shock that you have. So norepinephrine, start with norepinephrine, but if you determine it, say for example, it's cardiogenic shock, then you might add dobutamine as well to increase your uh um as an inotropic support, no? Or let's say for example, it's sepsis, no? Um norepinephrine plus fluid resuscitation and and um source control. So, let's say for example, it's obstructive shock, no? So uh, pericardiosynthesis plus norepinephrine. So it really depends. Norepinephrine is just the start, but then you have to continuously uh, diagnose your patient so that you will be able to tailor your interventions according to the shock that your patient has. Uh, that's very well explained, uh, Dr. Mali. No? Um, a common practice that we see is that uh, 
oftentimes uh, when you achieve ROSC, uh, one of the early questions of the loved ones and the relatives, of course, is do kamusta, no? And then if GCS3, and then when we check the pupils, fix dilated, tapos walang mga response to mga painful stimuli, no? And usually, we say na mukhang malabo, no? Uh, after the arrest. Is that is that a good practice? Is that uh, correct to prognosticate uh, the recovery of the patient based on GCS3, fixed dilated, lack of response to painful stimuli after after ROS. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so um, as I mentioned earlier during the talk, um, guidelines have actually advocated for delayed neuroprognostication. Definitely not within the 24 hours. Uh, uh, we have to advocate for the patient. You know, important. Of course, there will be findings like, aside from your neurological clinical bedside status, which is has been proven to be inaccurate at times. No, uh, marami na resources na basa na oh, you shouldn't rely on bedside neurologic examination for neuroprognostication. No, they have to have they have to do it multimodal, meaning to say EEG, CT scan, and expert consultation. But definitely withhold it from 72 hours unless no, it has been um, with, let's say, for example, an expert consultation. Like you can say, there's a massive hemorrhage, non-surgical, herniated name brain, and then neurosurgery, prognostic patient, neurology. That may be true. But that's an exemption rather than the rule. So withhold neuroprognostication 24, until 24 hours. But some actually advocate until 72 hours post-recovery. So meaning to say, uh, give the patient enough time to 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 have that window, and at the same time, when you neuro prognosticate, you have to ensure that it's multimodal, meaning to say it's not just because of a bedside uh, 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 assessment. You have to have other data supporting your neuro prognostication and other expert consultations as well, if available. Okay, and then you mentioned about uh. Ice packs, no? uh, um, and you've encountered um, in several conventions that they actually do ice packs. Um, uh, the um, targeted temperature management, no? the one with uh, the feedback mechanism and, and using core temperature monitoring is very prohibitive in terms of cost. Can you share more about the ice packs like post-arrest? Yeah. Like, uh, how, how do you actually do that correctly? Actually, how long are you going to do it? How do you measure the temperature? So uh, how do we apply it? Okay, so so actually, naisip ko yun, but then there was this talk about, so actually, share ko dapat siya, pero wala na time. Merong product in Singapore that's been determined by, uh, it's been developed by Marcos Ong. So si Dr. Marcos Ong, it's called Carbon Pool. So it's basically, carbon material na para siyang ice. So, para siyang vest kasi nalagyan siya ng carbon plates. So, it's not electric driven. It's very low cost. No? Uh, that's an alternative. Pero kung ice packs yung gagamitin, start, ang pinaka-important is you start it. Okay? So, you start it, ice packs, actually nag-roy. No? Of course, it's not gonna be the opt- most optimal. So, start from there. And then, ang isasabi kasi ni Doc Pao, the question is framed how do you monitor the patient? Ideally, rectal temp or esophageal temperature. Pero in a low-cost setting, ano yan? Tenga yan. Kaya lang siya range eh. So, ako, okay, honestly, uh, in the first four to six hours, hindi mo na may hit yung core body temperature, hindi ka bababa ng 32. Yan lang naman ayaw nila eh. Bumaba ng 32. So, okay. the more important thing is in the ED, start it. Start it. Okay. Ang dami kasi apprehensions o no, baka dito. Ang problema, hindi siya nasa start at all. So, I think in my professional opinion, start it first before you, you entertain the prohibitions na, ah, it's not going to be cost-effective, blah, blah, blah. More, more or less, ang problema, hindi natin sa starting. Kasi, yeah. ideally, when your institution has an ICU monitoring capable, then you put a patient up in ICU, then the patient can be closely monitored, no? Either monitor temperature, kasi in the range, the range talaga, 36 pa yung highest, and 33 yung lowest, eh. so some studies, too. So, yung, yung auditory temperature is like one to one and a half, C, uh, I think, Celsius away from rectal temperature. So, you can still use that as a range. What's important is we actually cool down the patient and give the patient a chance to survive. So, yun important. Okay. Yun nga lang, kailangan marami ng ice. <laughs> <laughs> 
basang-basa yung ano, yung ano, <laughs> gurney ng patient sa sa mga oh. I have a question here about seizures, no? Uh how do you address the the, the seizures? Anong gagawin? Do we give midazolam, diazepam, Keppra? What what's up the approach? Do you paralyze the patient? What's your okay. approach? Thanks for that question. Uh, seizures are in uh, when you uh look at you look at certain guidelines like your emergency neurological life support note. First line for it, benzodiazepines. So, lalo na for post cardiac arrest seizures, benzodiazepines for first line. Diazepam, um, short acting, uh, or midazolam. No, so diazepam longer acting kasi siya. So, I give it. 5 to 10. Actually, 10 na nga daw yung bagong dose kayo. 10 na push boomers. But then, if your patient is still seizing, you know, um, it is recommended to to either start um, um, continuous benzodiazepine infusion like midazolam drips. And then, um, as I mentioned earlier, sedation and paralysis are warranted. Uh, because, yun nga, um, if you're entertaining seizures and then you're cooling the patient, the patient won't hit the tar target temperature. Uh, when the patient is seizing or having convulsion. So if with benzo to stop your patient, you proceed to benzo uh your benzo drip, then deeper sedation and then paralysis. But of course paralysis needs expert consultation. So that everybody is trained to use your agents like rocuronium or so succinylcholine that increase that requires training. But if in a acute setting, uh benzodiazepines are in your first time. All right. Okay. So thank you very much, Dr. Omali. No, there was a very comprehensive lecture and very thorough, and we did learn a lot. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time and for your expert sharing of uh, information about this. Can I answer a question? Okay, question? Ah, okay, sorry. question uh, those down the atrophy for galophosphate. Okay, sorry, I did not see that. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yung local na when we used to, yung what we learned in PGH, yung local is um, atropine 10-15 minutes, then you give it at a uh, dose of 2 to 3 milligram IV uh, mm. uh, for, ano, for uh, depending on the pag moderate, pag Pag, so, depende yan, kung mild, moderate, severe. So, uh, usually, pag ang um, mild is 1 to 2, moderate is 2 to 3, severe is 2 to 5. So, ako 2 la lang. 2 every 10 to 15 minutes. But the more important thing is, may tina-target ka sa atropine. So, pupil size, heart rate, dry mouth, and hypoactive bowel sounds. So, yun. So, if you were still contacting, sorry, kind of phosphate poisoning, natawag ka pa ng poison control, give a bolus of 2 milligram um, every 10 to 15 minutes. Then you watch out for uh, tachycardia, heart rate of 140, pupils of 4 millimeters or higher. Then dry mouth and hypoactive bowels. So, atropinization is your target. Okay. No. But I think the best way is to be guided by a toxicologist. All right. Okay. Uh, post cardiac arrest care with a little sprinkle of toxicology on the side. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mali. Ah, uh, tingnan natin kung may mga tanong pa. Okay. Okay, wala naman na ata. Alright, so checking YouTube. Alright, wala ng questions. Alright. So, thank you so much, Dr. Mali, for your time. I really appreciate it for sharing your expertise and we really learned a lot this morning. And to our participants on Zoom and YouTube, thank you for participating. Uh, see you in next month's REM webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you,